say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I've sort I sent everybody a, you know a couple of email reminders with you know big bold print mm-hmm. saying it was today, but there's still the chance that you know people are on autopilot. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, offering to to move it to today. Um, I'm very I'm very happy to be uh, to be giving this. I'm very excited to see what people think about this work. No, we're happy to have you. Good, good. Yeah, we we usually have about uh, thirty or so. We're getting close to that, so maybe we'll just wait one more minute for people to realize that it's today, and we'll, <laughs> then we'll get going. This is one of the uh, downsides of having the remote talks. You can't go and knock on people's offices like, "Hey, come to the seminar." Exactly. Or just you know notice people streaming past your open door towards mm-hmm. the end of the hall and realize that it's time. Mm-hmm. I actually wanted to ask, how does it usually work with uh, questions in this seminar? So um, at the end of your talk, we'll just sort of let people ask whatever questions they want. They can either just unmute themselves and just pose the question directly, or they okay. can use the raise hand feature of Zoom and I'll sort of call okay. on them. It's you know a, a little bit informal. I don't think we have quite the tradition that you have at Cal of just sort of interrupting and asking questions in the flow of the talk, yeah. which I actually really appreciated. Okay. Um, but I think typically people wait until the end. Okay. That at that point, good. I'll just say, you know, anybody who has a question, feel free and just unmute yourself and that sounds good. ask away. Oh, dang. Apparently some people thought it was going to be a, an in-person seminar. Oops. I should have, I should have made that extra clear. The last couple have been. I think the next several are going to be remote like this. Uh-huh. But for whatever reason, the last couple um, included some people who are just on, on UCSD's up in the main campus. So they just mm-hmm. walked down. It's also possible it was buried at the bottom of the email, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been my bad. I'm not the best at communications. Yeah, we got 25 now. Let's get started, though, just yeah. for the sake of time. Um, so welcome, everybody, to today's seminar. I hope uh, people uh, read their emails and realize that it's on a Monday, not a Tuesday. This is the one exception of the year where the seminar is on a Monday because Walter Monk's birthday is tomorrow and the Walter Monk lecture is tomorrow. So today we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Will Davis. He's a PhD student at UC Berkeley. He works with Professor Bruce Buffett in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. He works on better understanding the geodynamo and explaining the Earth's paleomagnetic record using some, some pretty clever, uh, more recent uh, computational methods that I think can be applied to other systems as well. So that'll be exciting to hear about. Uh, Will received his combined bachelor's and master's degrees from the U- University College London in geophysics. He's originally from Cornwall, England, which I am told is the surfing capital of the mm-hmm. UK. So in a sense, he's coming home <laughs> when he comes to Scripps to, to speak to us, um, even if it's remotely. He's also an avid mushroom forager, so this should be, um, in any case, a very interesting talk. We'll give him 45 minutes to speak, and then we'll uh, open up the last uh, few minutes for questions. So, uh, Will, take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for that intro. All right, let me me get started. Oops. All right, so, yeah, thanks. uh, Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming along to my talk. I'm really... I'm really excited to be uh, to be able to be here virtually um, to to give this talk. So yeah, my name is William Davis. I'm uh, I'm working with Bruce Buffett uh, in uh, the part- Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Berkeley, and uh, my talk is titled uh, "Stochastic Models for the Geodynamo." And I and I put a subtitle here: Why is the Why is the Geodynamo so complicated? And um, I don't think I'm going to be able to completely answer this question today, but I'm going to be sort of raising some interesting points and spurring on some ideas about the complexity in the geodynamo. So let me get started. So yeah, the Earth, the Earth has a magnetic field. Um, it protects us from charged particles from the sun. And uh, this field has existed for geological time. Um, And I'm mostly going to be talking about the largest scale 
feature of the geodynamo. So this is the uh, dipole component. And I'm actually mostly going to be talking about the axial uh, part of this dipole component. So I said this, uh, this field has, uh, has been thought to exist for geological time. And we know that through the paleomagnetic records. So this is a collection of observations over various time scales that tell us about the strength of the magnetic field. And um, a lot of these observations are actually made by people in, uh, in this department here, Kathy and uh, other workers being among them. So I've put some uh, records here on the left of the uh, estimates of the axial dipole moment through a range of time scales. So on the top here, this is the uh, 10,000 year record, Calas 10.2. We've got a 2 million year record here, which uh, shows a couple of reversals. And then uh, over much broader time scales, we have these point measurements through time uh, of the strength of the field, as well as the overall polarity uh, of normal or reversed magnetic field. So these are really amazing records, really amazing observations. But one thing we would like to do is to ask the question, do these tell us anything about processes in the core, because these are some, these could be some of our only observations of the deep earth, the core, through geological time. So, um, yeah, we have these amazing records, but unfortunately, the, the dynamics of the geodynamo is, is really complicated. Um, so we have Navi the Navier-Stokes equation, we have the induction equation, we have different forces acting on different length scales and at different times. We have heat buoyancy, we have compositional buoyancy, we have boundary conditions on the core mantle boundary. It's incredibly complicated. Um, and on top of this, we're actually restricted in our observations. So as good as these uh, paleomagnetic magnetic observations are, uh, sometimes we can only infer the axial dipole and uh, the, the, these observations are limited in their distribution through time. But perhaps in this complicated system, we can find some sort of representative model that is low dimensional, but, but is a good descriptor of statistical variations. So I'm going to be arguing for that. But why might this, why might this even work? So I'm gonna just do a sketch for you at the moment of the physics here. So I've written down the induction equation. Uh, this is the change of the magnetic field in time, and it is governed by uh, an ohmic loss term here, and then a uh, term that describes the production of magnetic field uh, through induction here. And if we just do an average over the whole sphere, of the, uh, of the core, we can actually define the axial dipole moment here. So I'm averaging over the whole sphere. And then on the right-hand side, I am partitioning these terms uh, over a stable polarity cron, where I am saying the decays go into one term here, and then these sources here go into another term here. And so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to further partition these into uh, separate parts. So I'm saying this source term here is uh, fluctuating quite fast because it's uh, depending on the velocity. So I'm going to partition it into an average component and then this uh, remainder component, which has zero mean. This decay term here, you can do some, uh, some analysis looking at the decay modes of the sphere, of, of the magnetic field. And uh, it turns out that there's like a length scale, uh, a time scale that's associated with the decay here. So on average, these two balance each other out. And we, if you do a little bit of rearranging, you have an equation that looks like this, where we have these deterministic components here that is describing the average decay of the axial dipole moment back to the time average on some sort of time scale. And this is uh, being added to by these fast scale variations from this induction part. So this sort of conceptually has 
the form of a stochastic differential equation. This sort of slow deterministic part here and a, first, uh, and a fast random part here. And this is what I'm going to be arguing is going to be a good model for axial dipole moment variations. But just a quick recap on stochastic differential equations. So um, I've, I've done a, a, a small example here of a stochastic differential equation where you have um, a derivative on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you have a deterministic function that slowly sort of evolves and describes your evolution towards stable points. And then a random term here where you can imagine that this eta uh, at every single time step, it's uh, you're drawing from a Gaussian distribution or whatever distribution you want really. And this is uh, causing these short time scale raises and drops in your, in your parameter. And uh, it turns out that if you have both of these terms here, you don't just tend to a single stable point, you actually sort of tend to a distribution and uh, walk around it. And so these stochastic differential equations have been used a lot in various different fields in physics. And more recently, they've been used to describe uh, axial dipole moment variations. So this is work by Brendel and also my advisor, Bruce Buffett, where they have taken uh, some of these paleomagnetic records like PADM 2M and interpreted the slow decays and the fast variations uh, of this record as the result of a stochastic differential equation. And uh, they've shown that the statistics of this um, actually fit very well. But I wanted to take this a little step further. I mean, you know, it's a good, it's a good statistical fit, but th does this actually tell us anything? So I wanted to look at the physical interpretations of this drift term and this noise term here. So what do these actually physically relate to inside the core? Hey, William, can I ask a question quickly? Yeah, sure. This is John Colosi. Yeah. yeah so so your, your noise term is a multiplicative noise, right? So you have a G of X. It's not just an additive noise yes. to the differential equation. Yes, that's, that's a very good point, John. So at every uh, step in time, this, the amplitude that is assigned to this random part here can, in fact, depend on your amplitude of axial dipole moment variations. That's a very good point. Okay, but I'm actually, very good. But I'm actually going to show later that um, the, the multiplicity of this uh, doesn't actually matter. But uh, l let's put a pin in that and I'll come back to that later. OK, very good. Thanks, William. So yeah, I said that I was going to investigate the physical interpretations. So the way that I'm going to do this is I run these very computationally intensive uh, 3D geodynamo simulations. I'm showing a video of an output of, uh, of, of the vorticity from one of them. And the idea is that I can essentially do the same thing. I can build a stochastic differential equation from this result. But then afterwards, I can open this simulation back up and see what is, the, what, what is this drift term physically relating to? What is this noise term here physically linked to? And the idea is that I can do that and apply these, uh, these inferences to the paleomagnetic record as well. So that's generally the plan. Uh, I'm going to conduct these numerical geodynamo simulations and I'm going to estimate these stochastic functions and parameters from them. Then I'm going to investigate the relationships between these parameters and the physical features in the geodynamo and then apply these implications to the paleomagnetic record. So let's start. So I'm gonna show you one numerical simulation first. So this is a simulation that I ran. This is the axial dipole moment of the simulation that I ran for uh, about a scale time of 400,000 years at these parameters here on the right. And generally what I want to do is Supposing, uh, I suppose that this is created by a stochastic differential equation with some general drift function and some general noise function. And I want to estimate 
what the form of this drift term and this noise term are from the data. So how do you do this? So this is kind of an abstract way of in seeing what I've done. So uh, we're supposing that this, these functions f and g, the drift and noise functions, are creating this time series. And we don't get to see this panel here on the left. One thing that we can't do is forward modeling. So let's say we estimated, we chose by random uh, exactly the right drift in the noise functions and then did a forward model here. Um, we would produce a time series, but because this is a random process, we will never get the exact same thing. You'll actually work with probability zero. So we need to do something a bit smarter. What we do is we map this time series back onto a statistic that is sort of halfway between abstract and concrete. So we map it onto a statistic and then we can either use that statistic directly or do a fit to it with some basis functions and use that statistic in some sort of inverse theory to estimate what the drift and the noise function are. So it does require some theory here. All right, so that's the plan. But what is this statistic that I'm mapping it onto? So I've, I'm showing my simulation again up in this top panel, and I have color coded it by amplitude. And I'm going to show you this statistic here. It's called conditional moments. So what does this mean? So this is telling us um, some short time shift, time step in the future, where am I going to go if I'm in one bin? So let's say I'm at a high axial dipole moment. I'm in this blue region here at the top. At 3,000 years in the future, I'm more likely to go down back towards the time average. And that's what this first moment here is showing on this left plot in blue. I'm more likely to go down. Likewise, if I'm in this orange section here, if I'm at a low amplitude, I'm more likely to go up in the future. And that's what this orange line here is showing. So that's what the mean does in the future. But we can ask the same thing for the variance of possible states going into the future. And that's what this second moment here is showing on the right. So this is data that I'm taking from my time series and I'm going to feed into the inverse theory. Uh, and one thing that I wanted to illustrate is that these are sort of uh, representative cross sections through the actual data. The actual data is much more fine scaled. So I'm showing uh, on the right here, a 3D projection of, uh, of all of these uh, sections through the data. So this is what the conditional moments actually physically look like. That's it rotated. And here's the second moment here in 3D. So a really important uh, piece of information here is the maximum time shift that I look at in the future. So this is the maximum length of time that I'm looking forwards and seeing where am I changing or where am I increasing or not. So the maximum difference that I use to feed into the statistics is about 3000 years. So it's quite short. And this is gonna be an important number for later. So keep this in mind. So those are my statistics. And the inverse theory is, it's pretty complicated. So you go and read this paper in Physical Review E, and it's, uh, it's 25 pages of stochastic calculus. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite a bit to get through, but it's a really good paper. And essentially what they do is they show that if you suppose a drift and a noise function, you can calculate what your conditional moments should be. And they actually provide an inverse theory for this as well. So if you have your moments, you can do, you can invert for your drift and noise function. So that's what I'm showing on this left plot here. The data is in black, and then the inverse solution is in red. And then you do a little bit of iterating and fitting. Uh, so you iterate these two functions here until your theory matches your data. And then you have your, uh, your estimated drift and noise functions. So this is what they actually look like. 
So this is the drift function here on the left. I have, uh, what this is saying is that when you are at a low axial dipole moment, the drift function is positive. That means it's driving you up towards the time average. Likewise, when your drift function is, uh, when, when your state is high, when you're at a high value of axial dipole moment, your drift function is negative. That means it's driving you down towards, again, towards the time average. And uh, your noise function here is saying, what uh, amplitude do you assign to that random noise at each time step? And it's pretty much flat for all states. So John, this is what you were, uh, what, what you were referring to, is it multiplicative or not? In fact, it, it looks like it's, it's generally uh, an additive noise. Uh, the noise that's assigned to, the, to this noise term is essentially invariant of whatever state you're at. So if you, if you remember back, I did a sketch of the theory and it turns out that it was surprisingly quite a good estimate that we predicted that we, we would have this linear drift term here that is driving you towards the time average and a constant noise term. And we can say that in this dynamo simulation, this was, this was largely satisfied. So uh, I'm going to try and convince you even more that this is a good model. And I'm going to be doing this by looking at the power spectra of this process. Uh, actually, no, wait. first of all, I'm just going to say that uh, this, is a huge, this is a huge reduction in the complexity of this system. We have this time series that is uh, sort of very complicated, but the, but the stochastic differential equation that we get from it is in fact incredibly simple. Uh, in fact, it's only depending on three parameters, the slope of this drift function, the time average, and the amplitude of the noise. So this is an incredible reduction in complexity. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the, uh, the power spectra. So uh, in black is the power spectra of my numerical simulation. And uh, in blue is another simulation that I ran at the exact same parameters but at a different initial condition. So we can uh, see that this uh, sort of power spectra is pretty well defined. And what I can also do is I can plot the power spectra of the stochastic differential equation. And this is what it looks like. It's a pretty good fit, I would say, within uncertainties. Um, and this is kind of amazing because you remember that maximum time shift that I put in, in the initial, in the, uh, conditional moments was 3000 years. That relates to information on this order here in this gray box. So only information on this time scale is being fed in and yet it predicts all the way back here to these really long period signals. So this is a good model. But uh, this is just one or, or two dynamo simulations why don't we do some more and see if this uh, pattern still fits? So yes, I did these two simulations here, uh, these geodynamo simulations that are driven at the top and the bottom, at the core mantle boundary and the inner core boundary. And I actually did another simulation at this setup, but I increased the vigor of convection. Uh, so I'm, I'm making it convect more vigorously. I also experimented with a completely different setup, one that is driven solely from the inner core. And I've actually shut off the, uh, the, the, the heat flux at the boundary, at the core mantle boundary. And I did two simulations at this setup. So these are wildly different regimes of convection. And in fact, they all have a linear drift function and they all have a constant noise function and the power spectra fits on all of these. So this is, this is pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to show you what the noise term, what the amplitude of the noise term looks like for all of these simulations. So this is the noise term here, this term in green, and I've plotted the noise term uh, in these plots here. So this is the top and bottom driven one. This is the bottom driven cases. And you can see I've got the initial Raleigh numbers here and then the increased Raleigh numbers uh, with the arrow pointing towards them. 
So there's a couple of things to note here that the noise amplitude increases with the vigor of convection. It kind of makes intuitive sense, I think. But also these uh, geodynamo simulations driven from the inner core, uh, inner core boundary and the core mantle boundary have a noise amplitude that's about 10 times higher than these bottom driven cases. So this is really significant. But I really want to see like, these are, these, are, these are interesting results, but what do these physically relate to inside the core? So summary so far, uh, I've investigated two regimes of convection in these simulations, and this SDE fit is an amazing fit for all of them. But I want to investigate what the physical interpretations of these are. So I'm just gonna do this for the noise and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, so I want, to, I want to link this noise amplitude to something physical inside the geodynamo. And so I'm gonna do this in, uh, by, by sort of going at it from two different directions. So first of all, let's think about the stochastic model. So I want to relate this G, this amplitude to something. So if we go back and I had this sort of sketch of the theory, these source fluctuations, I want to relate these two. So on short time scales, and time scales shorter than this decay, we can look at the mean squared deviations of these. And we actually find that the root mean squared deviations follow this pattern here, where you have the noise amplitude and it's uh, sort of growing with the square root of a time which is shorter than this decay time scale here. So that's one way to get at the source from the stochastic model. Now let's do the physical side of this. So we can estimate this S term, this source directly from the simulations. So we have this cross term here in the induction equation, and I can measure this from the geodynamo simulations. One thing that we actually do to estimate this term here is to suppose that this is generated by the alpha effect where um, you have these magnetic field lines that are being lifted and then twisted by velocity variations here. And um, Moffat gives, a, uh, gives an order of magnitude approximation of this term here. So we can actually calculate what it is. So this is the azimuthal magnetic field, the root mean squared velocity field, the length scale of these sort of twisting field lines and then the diffusivity. So with this, I can get a physical estimate of what the variations of the source would be from the geodynamo simulation. And it, and it is depending on the velocity field and the magnetic field. So I have these two different estimates here in gray and in red and I'm gonna show you how they compare. So I'm plotting on both of these, the noise variations, this root mean squared. So I'm showing just the stochastic model now, and this is what the physical model gives for it. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty good match. There's a little bit of discrepancy for this bottom driven case, but this is matching over wildly different geodynamo simulations. This is a really different regime of convection and yet we still get a very good fit from this. So this is really quite interesting. We can relate these uh, stochastic parameters to physical features inside the core. So that was how I interpreted the noise amplitude. And I could, I could go on and interpret the other parameters in stochastic differential equations, but it would take quite a while. Um, you can go and read my, my recent paper in JGI for this. Um, but essentially the idea is the drift term is related to turbulently enhanced decay of the slowest decay mode. And then there's also an interesting story going over with the correlation, this noise as well. And that's the characteristic time scale of these velocity fluctuations. But let's just keep on thinking about this noise amplitude for now. And I want to investigate the implications that this have for uh, interpreting the reversal rate. So what, what does this supercron here physically relate to, for instance? So 
uh, let's just think, we, we need to extend our theory a little bit here because I was just originally considering one stable polarity cron. Um, but it turns out because of the symmetry of the geodynamo equations, if you have um, one, one stable sort of section here, you should have a mirror image of it in the reversed polarity. And there's some other theory that you can look at that shows that the drift term for a reversing dynamo should be an odd function and it should go through zero at the origin. So another way to think about the drift term is if you think about a potential field and the negative gradient of this potential is actually the drift term. So this is what I'm showing here on the right. You have two valleys with a hill between them. And at each point here, you have a stable cron. And so the noise is making you rattle around inside this valley. And a reversal is when you get enough random variations that push you over this hill, and then you fall back into this other hill here. So that's a reversal. And some very smart people in uh, physical chemistry have worked out that you can actually estimate what the probability flux going from one stable polarity to the other is in terms of some physical features of the system. So the probability flux of going and reversing is dependent on uh, this sort of slope of your drift term here, and also the height of the potential well, and turns out the amplitude of the noise. So if you have a very high noise, you can switch back and forth at will. But if you have a very low noise term, very low noise amplitude, you rattle around at the bottom of this valley and you never get out. And that's a supercron. So let's, uh, let's think about this more physically using this, these interpretations that I've, uh, that I've sort of developed in this study. So we have an expression for the reversal rate and uh, it's related to this noise amplitude. But I've shown through my interpretations that this noise amplitude is strongly correlated to these velocity fluctuations. So we can, we can uh, estimate some of these stochastic parameters from paleomagnetic records. And this is done in a study by, uh, by Matty and my advisor a couple of years ago. And what I've done is I've supposed that only this noise term here is changing. And I'm relating this back directly to velocity variations inside the core. And I've investigated how different velocity variations would actually produce different reversal rates. And that's what I'm showing here on the left. So I've computed all possible velocity variations from zero to 200% and calculated what the reversal rate would be, keeping everything else constant. And uh, that's this black line here. And our present day reversal rate is at about four reversals per million years. And that sits about here, this red dot. So this is really interesting. It's a really non-linear relation. And I think the most interesting part here is that we are, the, the field is in a currently reversing regime. But if we, we were to really uh, sort of, if we were to reduce the velocity variations in the core by less than half, we would sort of cross over this critical boundary here and we would be in a non reversing state. And this would initiate a supercron, essentially. Another interesting thing here is that if the velocity variations were to be pushed higher and higher and higher, the reversal weight rate would actually saturate eventually, and we would get sort of saturated reversals going back and forth. So this is, this is what I've done. This is, uh, this is uh, sort of work looking at uh, stochastic models for the axial dipole moment and physical relations to them. And so, so I, I subtitled the, the start of this talk of why is the geodynamo so complicated? Um, but actually, I think a more pertinent question is why is the geodynamo so simple? 
we sh I showed that a really low dimensional stochastic differential equation is actually an incredibly good model for variations. I showed that a three, a three parameter equation actually uh, fits the power spectra incredibly well. So yeah, why, why is it so simple? Um, I'm not gonna be able to answer that this talk, but I think that's a really interesting thing to look at in the future. Furthermore, I've shown that these stochastic parameters can actually provide insights on core conditions. We can get estimates of collect, uh, convective velocities and perhaps even the state of the core mantle boundary heat flux, even just looking at the noise. And this provides us a really useful tool to interpret the paleomagnetic record going forward into the future. So I've got a little bit of bonus stuff to show. Um, and uh, this sort of bonus, uh, bonus information is uh, some, some work that I've been doing with Matty recently. And I thought it would be really cool to show this to everyone. So this is sort of um, motivated by a comment that Kathy gave me at AGU two years ago. So I presented an earlier version of this work and she said, oh, this is very good, Will, but um, this is only a one component uh, model here. You're only looking at the axial dipole field. What about a full 3D, uh, or a full three component dipole? What about higher degrees looking at the quadrupole and the octopole? Could you estimate a stochastic differential equation that has more than one dimension? And I've been thinking about this and I think this would be a really interesting thing to investigate. Uh, unfortunately, there's a problem though. So you remember back to this sort of uh, diagram that I showed about how to do this inverse problem. So this asterisk here is requires theory. And in general, this theory doesn't exist for stochastic differential equations with dimension higher than one. Uh, with some caveats, it, it, it doesn't exist in general. So we're gonna have to do something new. And this is one idea that I've come up with. So I said that uh, forward modeling wouldn't work. Well, I lied. Uh, but I think it could work in this, in this situation here. So say I estimate a drift function and a noise function, I can do my forward model and get a time series from this. But instead of comparing these time series piecewise or pathwise, uh, let's say I just map them back to the same statistic and then I compare the statistic instead so I don't need to use this complicated inverse theory that might not even exist. I can just compare these two statistics. Um, but how am, I, how am I even going to sort of iterate through a drift and a noise function? How do I, how do I sample that? How do I update my parameters? So um, one of the things that I've been looking at with Matty is using neural networks as function approximators. So the idea is that you uh, define your drift and your noise functions with a neural network that is dependent on some parameters. And so this, this isn't too scary. We just have a neural network, which is just a function that takes you from input, some input space to some output space. So you could just make this a one to uh, uh, a one, uh, to one function. So I um, have one input and one output. And all of these nodes here, they take in some input and then they spit out some output to each of these other nodes here. And each of these nodes is governed by some weights and some biases that all feed, that are all defined by these parameters here. And it turns out that if you actually use these as function approximators, they have some really uh, really nice attributes to them. They're universal approximators, which means that given enough of these nodes, I can get within epsilon close to any function at all. They're also pretty efficient. You don't need many of these nodes to actually um, approximate some of these functions. And neural networks aren't uh, aligned to any basis. Um, these, these sort of calculations are also optimized for hardware as well. So I can use 
these neural networks to define drift and noise functions. And so they are, they are set by some parameters here, but how do I update these parameters to get good fits? So again, I use another thing from machine learning here. I use this algorithm called automatic differentiation. So the idea is that you, you have a candidate drift and noise function and you do your forward model and you are uh, comparing the two statistics from your data and your model. And from that, you get a loss, a loss function, uh, which is dependent on your parameters of your neural networks. And what you want to do is calculate the gradient of this loss function with respect to your parameters so that you can update these parameters to minimize the error and you want to get towards the global minimum. And there's a really, really interesting algorithm that's been used in machine learning called automatic differentiation, where uh, it's kind of incredible, really. It's just repeated application of the chain rule through all of the elementary instructions in your forward model. And it spits out the gradient just automatically. Um, there are a few caveats. You have to write your forward model in a certain way, but it's really incredibly efficient. You just get your gradient automatically. Uh, so you can update your parameters and drive you towards this global minimum. So this is kind of a, a sort of paradigm called scientific machine learning. So I'm actually using these two different concepts from machine learning, neural networks, and automatic differentiation, but I'm using it in science, which means uh, I've been able to embed my scientific knowledge into this system here. This isn't just blind fitting with TensorFlow or something. So I'm going to show you a, a result that I have of training a neural network to fit a stochastic differential equation. And I think this is pretty cool. So hopefully this animation is going to work. Here we go. So on the left plots here, we have our drift and noise functions. The true one is in black. And then these colored ones are what the neural network is predicting for it. And what I do is from these, I do a forward model and I predict the time series, which is in red. And then from the time series, I calculate the moments, this first moment here and the second moment in here. And I'm calculating the error between the data and the model. And then I'm plotting this here as a loss function. So I'm using this algorithm, this automatic differentiation algorithm to slowly sort of push these drift and noise functions towards their true values just by comparing the moments with each other. So even though you can't compare these time series, you can compare the moments. And you can see that when I start these, uh, these sort of uh, iterations, the prediction for the drift and the noise function is really awful, but it slowly pushes itself towards the true values uh, as the moments fit with each other. And let me show you, let me just wait until this is stopped and then I'll stop it on the final bit. There we go. So this is, this is our final sort of state here where we've actually predicted the drift function and the noise function here very well. We've minimized the loss function by comparing just these moments, not the time series itself. So this is, this is scientific machine learning. This is being able to embed your prior scientific knowledge into a flexible machine learning framework. And I think this is a really interesting way to go forwards in sciences because it allows you to use small quality, oh, sorry, small quantity, high quality data in these flexible machine learning frameworks. So you don't need big data for this. Um, you, can, you can use these things on hardware optimized uh, machinery. And um, I think this is a really interesting way to go forwards in physical modeling, physics-informed machine learning. So that was kind of a final conclusion of, uh, of what I wanted to show today. 
Um, so I've shown you physical insights into core processes. I've shown you some mathematical tools that I've been working on, these stochastic differential equations. And I've also shown you a little glimpse of some work that I've been doing with these computational advances in scientific machine learning. Um, I would encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in this work, check out my GitHub, because I've got all of my code that I use freely available there. Or you can contact me uh, by my email address here. And finally, I just wanted to show, I'm, I'm really, I like making animations of scientific things. And so uh, I'm showing here a sort of a two well model for a reversing axial dipole moment um, and how this would be projected onto seafloor spreading and, um, and uh, marine magnetic anomalies, just for fun. So yeah, with that, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm very happy to present here and yeah, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Will, that was amazing. Uh, we Thanks. really appreciated it. Uh, I think we have some questions. For, uh, I think um, Peter Shearer raised his hand. Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, so it was a great talk. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm um, thinking about this the right way, but um, to go back to uh, a, a, a dipole uh, yeah. part of the talk, I would have thought if uh, uh, the deterministic part you know, has the form of a, uh, a decay um, back to the mean, that uh, the time series um, would have a, uh, a time uh, a, a direction. In other words, it wouldn't be symmetric in time. But when I look at uh, how the time series um, uh, uh, to my eye, <clears throat> um, at least I wouldn't be able to tell if, if you were to switch it. I'm, 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 I'm left to right. So mm -hmm. um, is there something that I'm missing or what is um, going on in terms of the decay term? Let me try and understand what you're saying. So are you, are you saying decays from below and above should be symmetric? Or are you saying that if you were to essentially feed this in backwards, would it would it give the same result? Right. I mean, in in some of the plots that you showed, um, uh, I mean, I think it was one of the early slides. You know, it had the form um, of a decay function. You know, looked like this. Mm -hmm. So then I would think you would see that <laughs> like that, and you wouldn't see this. Uh, yeah. So okay. I'm just wondering if there is um, something, you know, that's uh, 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 in the equations, you know, that would either um, give you time symmetry or not. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I guess so. We do have the ohmic decay, so that's sort of giving you that that's sort of breaking the time symmetry i would say because that's that's a decay term and so you wouldn't get you you wouldn't get time symmetry going back from that but i think i think the induction part could be you you could interpret that in a time symmetric way but um yeah no that's that's a that's an interesting thing to think about and i'll and i'll I'll try and keep on thinking if there's anything that I can add to that. It actually does remind me when I when I first did this, when I was a graduate student four years ago, um, Bruce gave me some data and uh, I accidentally fed it in backwards. Um, and I got not the exact same result as when I correctly fed it in forwards. So sort of by that anecdotal uh, <laughs> sort of um, evidence there, I would say that it would not be a time, uh, time invariant uh, sort of solution. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks. 
Um, Masa Dasavan, do you want to ask your question next? Hi, Will. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. It's so cold in here. The sun is outside. My brain can't compute. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I think it's a couple slides down. Just go like four slides further. Uh, do you want to go guess, here maybe. or? Actually, no, I'm just going to tell you what I remember what it was and you'll okay, know what okay. it is. Okay. Um, you were talking about, you said like in a conclusion sort of esque slide, but it's not the end of the whole thing. Um, yeah, this. Um, you were talking about, so in the physical interpretations, you were saying that the drift was basically ohmic diffusion with some turbulence. Yes. Kind of like shoving at it. Yes. Um, can you show me how you figured that out again? Because yeah, so, either so, it happened really fast or I spaced out. Yeah, no, no, it's it's okay. I didn't actually explain it um, because it took me two years to figure out what was going on and it was pretty complicated. Okay. Um, but the idea is that, okay, so I'm going to show you this plot here and I'm going to try and explain what's going on. Okay. So um, I was looking at the different decay modes inside. So I was looking at the poloidal decay modes inside the core okay. and you can, you can do this decomposition and each mode has a characteristic time scale. The longest of which is about 49,000 years and then it goes 10,000 years and then five okay. or something maybe. It's, it's four, divided by four, then divided by nine, then divided by Yeah, nine. yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I wanted to see like how this decay would actually match up with uh, this decay from the stochastic model, right? Mm -hmm. And I was actually finding that if, if I were to look at how these, these decay modes were decaying, they're, they're, the, the slowest one was decaying faster than the stochastic model, oh, sorry. Then the decay mode. Yeah, the yeah, it was, it was decaying faster than the yeah. decay mode. So I was like, what was, what's going on? And sort of on top of that, um, this, this sort of higher order modes. So this is the first mode I'm showing here at the top. And then the second and third modes, these higher order modes are actually sort of, they're, they're not conditioned on the decay of the axial dipole moment at all. So it's kind of like all of the dynamics are coming from the slowest decay mode. And then also that slowest decay mode is decaying faster than it should be. So it's like, what's going on? And so after a lot of work, I, I sort of finally concluded that it must be turbulence that's, that's doing this. So turbulence is driving the decay back towards the time average faster than the decay mode should be able to let it. So the turbulence is advection, right? Like we can consider it a part of advection. So yeah. then in, the, in the, the stochastic equation, the turbulence would be, what's your notation? Wait, go back to your equation. You're using different letters than I do. So I don't know. What okay, that. okay. <laughs> um, um, can I show you, where's a good one to show you? This one here? Yeah, that, that's, that's good. Okay, so the turbulence will be in the eta, right? Um, no, no, it's in, in this, in this slope of the drift term here, so the gamma here. Okay, so that's that. This is where I get stuck. So um, when you look at um, spectra from data and stuff, I get the same result. I get that the um, the the one over gamma yeah. is is smaller than like math says it should be when you do dynamo math, and yeah. um, and that's a problem. So um, what I'm trying to understand is if turbulence is an advective process. Mm -hmm. And when you put, if you go two slides down um, right there, you see how you have two versions of it, one with the S and one with the eta, right? Yeah. So um, in the one, basically what I get from this is that all of the advection stuff has to be in the green, in the S and the eta, and then all of the non-advection stuff is in the drift. No, I would say that the average parts of that, the average advection and the average turbulence is going into the drift term here. And then the remainder from the average oh. is being partitioned into the noise. Okay. Okay. So all of the, okay. So any diffusion and any average advection is on the left and yeah. any extra stuff is on the right. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
that's um, my that's my conclusion at least uh, i'll i'll send you the preprint print of my paper i think i have it okay good yeah, it's good. in my desk um okay. <laughs> um and then i have um i had one more question but now i can't remember um and the last thing was um at the very end you were talking about doing like G11 and like the other parts of the dipole, the other two directions. Yes. Um, there's a 2016 paper by um, Buldiga. Mm -hmm. I can email it to you. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, I think um, I think I remember reading it. Yeah. Yeah, she she does some of well, she does like she puts this model and she does it for the multipolar stuff instead yeah. of the dipole. I think she was fitting it directly from the power spectra. Yeah, I think so too. I don't remember. I remember only the first half of that paper. Mm -hmm. So that's what she did. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for those questions. Yeah. Uh, Maddie, you're next. Uh, Jeff can go first. <laughs> I have nothing or um, I mean, All right, let, let go Jeff go it. first. Yeah. Oh, oh, thanks. Thanks, Maddie. Um, I was just wondering um, if you tried fitting any. Um, any dynamo models that have more variability and specifically the amount of variability is is seems quite small mm -hmm. uh, and would the would the drift term be constant that's a very good point and um so i ran these simulations to be very stable they they are still pretty realistic they're strongly dipolar but they're very stable because i just wanted to look at this the variations in one stable cron but you're right if we did have more variable geodynamo simulations, it is, um, it's not known whether this uh, noise term would be constant over the entire spectra. In fact, um, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is looking at a reversing geodynamo model, and I'm seeing that the noise term is essentially flat, but then during a reversal, during those low axial dipole moment states, uh, the noise term increases pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. And that, that, sort of, um, that, that, that sort of dynamics wouldn't be captured in this physical model here. This is a physical model for the state, for stable crons. All right, yeah, thanks. I was, I was also, if I could, just one more brief thing. Um, your uh, reversal frequency analysis. I was I was wondering. So if you think about things that paleomagnetism might actually be able to tell us, um, mm -hmm. you know, reversal frequency is is one that you know we can probably do pretty well at. Um, yeah. And the values you know are are very high there. I was just wondering if there was something if you could put some bounds on reversal frequency from paleomagnetism. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. No, that's a good thing to think about. One thing that I have been actually looking at is not just a single value of reversal rate, but like a distribution of reversal rates, because these aren't instantaneous things. Like people used to use a Ponsor model for reversals, but they, they, they can't be uh, you know, instantaneous things. These have finite length scales. So I'm actually looking at um, a, a reversing geodynamo simulation and how, um, how the distribution of cron lengths, you know, what, what is that for the numerical result? And then what is that for a stochastic model as well? Um, so yeah, but, but that's a good point. And bounds on these reversal rates is actually a, a good idea. I should look into that. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Maddie's next, but I'm going to abuse my host privileges by inserting myself to ask a question <laughs> I want to ask, which is that, um, Will, you mentioned that your dynamo simulations only went for about 3,000 years, yet seem to magically predict the power spectrum for like a much longer time scale. Does this mean that it's really only the geodynam geodynamo dynamics on the 3,000 year time scale that really matters for determining the dipole moment of the Earth's magnetic field, or is something else going on there? Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, I would, I mean, the, the interpretation that I got from it is that you can feed in a small amount of information and yet it protects all the way back because the model is representative of all the dynamics, whether that translates directly towards the, uh, towards the, the true core, the true paleomagnetic spectrum, I would be really interested to see if that it's true. I mean, we, we do see 
these similar power spectras in the paleomagnetic observations. Kathy isn't here, but some of her work is definitely related to this sort of slope zero section, a slope negative two section, and a slope negative four section here. One of the tricky things is that it's difficult to directly use this method on paleomagnetic data because this short time scale stuff is really heavily affected by uh, sedimentation, sedimentation effects and, and smoothing from other processes. So you have to go at it from a different standpoint that Matty and uh, Bruce have been looking at. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think it works well because it's a good model. I, I think of it like Hooke's law, really. You have uh, an incredibly simple equation that is a brilliant approximation for, you know, stretching a material or stretching a spring, which is billions of particles or whatever. Hooke's, war, Hooke's law works because it's a good model of the physics. And I think this is, this is a reflection of that. Thanks. Uh, Maddie, you're next. Okay, just, um, I don't quite understand why you said on, on the last part of your talk, the machine learning part of your talk, maybe you can clarify yeah. why you get away or why you anticipate that you can get away with limited data. Because I don't see, I don't see exactly that limited, you made a strong case for that. By limited, I mean not big data. We don't need gigabytes and gigabytes of data. The, the essential idea is that to, to approximate a function with these neural networks, typically you, you need, you know, as many data points, as many samples as possible, so that you can go through this sort of um, potential uh, landscape and, and iterate towards your global minimum. But if, you're, if, if your sort of forward model is not just a random, you know, it's, it's not just some sort of random network, it's actually vastly constrained. And we're actually saying that our forward model is the result of a ordinary differential equation or a stochastic differential equation that reduces our parameter space down to the results of stochastic differential equations. So it's like a vast sort of narrowing down and funneling down to we, we are sort of iterating through these these noise and drift functions here, and we are only looking at the results of SDEs. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So that's why you don't need big data. You can use high quality, small data with this. That's still maybe bigger than what we have, right? It's possible, yes. But there, some of the ideas of scientific machine learning is thinking about these clever ways that we can add in our constraints to these very flexible frameworks. That's, that's sort of the, the whole motivation yeah. behind it. Thank you. And if I can ask you one more clarifying question, or yep. I don't want to you know, stretch this out for too long. So if, you, <laughs> if we need to, but go ahead. Maybe you want to clarify a little bit. I, I, I get a little bit confused with your um, constant noise uh, function there, because I think that your noise is a correlated one, right? Yeah. And then, because otherwise you would not get the, you said about zero slope, two slope and four slope and everything. You only get that because of the correlated noise. But yes. then you keep talking about a three parameter model, but I think you would need at least, uh, at least four, right? Because if I count there's gamma, X bar, G bar, and then a thing that tells me how my noise is correlated, right? You're I just get sometimes confused with your slides about where you're using, I mean, you are using all the way through a correlated noise model or yes. not? Yes, I am. But I didn't want to bring it up because I think it adds quite a bit of complexity to this whole talk. Um, and I would say that the broad scale results that I was showing here are, they're definitely dependent on the correlated noise, but I can tell this story without having to explicitly bring it up. So as a little bit of a backstory, I spent, I think two years or so doing this project while assuming uncorrelated correlated noise. And I was using all of these methods that other people have previously used. 
and it was awful. I was getting awful fits for these stochastic functions here and nothing was making sense. And then finally, after a lot of effort, I, um, I, you know, Bruce and I found this paper here where you can add in correlated noise. And this is a much, much more robust model. Um, and so, yes, we do estimate a correlation of the noise that goes into this. Um, so this, uh, wait, here we go. This eta here has a correlation time scale and it is finite um, and it is non-zero. But is that, uh, is, that, is that found to be constant or does that vary with, um, with the uh, ADM? Uh, well, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, it's a time scale, so uh, it it is constrained. It's constrained to be constant. Okay. I think further going further and saying, you know, is 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 the correlation of the noise varying through time? Uh, that's that that could be done in in further work as well. Okay. But this already represents a big leap forward from just uncorrelated white noise. And then the, you know, the other, I think maybe going back to what Mayuri also asked you about the, some of these classical techniques, the Kramer's rule, mm. I don't think they are made for correlated noise, right? So no. Then you, then you just toss it away, but at the same time you say that the correlated noise is really critical. No, so you can actually make modifications to Kramer's rule to allow for uncorrelated noise. Um, it's, it's quite simple. You just instead of having a one parameter Markov uh, process, you, you extend that and you have a two parameter Markov process and then it works actually just the same. Okay, very good. Thanks, Will, this has been great. I don't wanna hold anybody any longer since we're already 10 minutes past. <laughs> yeah, and I ask all these detailed questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, please take the discussion offline. Um, yeah. you know, I'm sure Will's free to meet all day if you wanna chat yeah, yeah. for him. So um, obviously let's uh, thank Will once again for speaking to us and um, We'll see you next week for the seminar on Tuesday as usual. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Glad to be here.